Well, good evening and welcome to the fourth Tunbridge winter evening. Welcome to the Tunbridge Public Library. Um, before we go on, please remember, remember to come back in two weeks when our guest will be Dr. Michael Sporn, and two weeks after that, um, Ken Squire will be here. But tonight, our guest is Giovanna Peebles, who retired on July 1st, 2014, as Vermont State Archaeologist. Now, she thinks I'm going to introduce her, but actually, I'm going to let her introduce herself. I'm going to read you some excerpts from an article that she published in the Journal of the Society for American Archaeology in 2011. So she doesn't know I'm going to do this. I decided to be an archaeologist in the sixth grade when my mother received a book called Archaeology at a cocktail party and handed it off to me, the tomboy in a family of urban, urbane Milanese who had immigrated to New York. I still have it, inscribed Giovanna Morselli, 1963. A collection of little vignettes by a few dozen archaeologists, I was astounded that people could discover such interesting things and places. I was captured by the stories from the Rosetta Stone, one of my favorites, to Tutankhamun from Harappa to Folsom, New Mexico, written by these archaeologists, all men, except for one woman writing about Paleolithic cave art. It sure sounded like fun. An adventure and interesting too. From that point on, I was going to be an archaeologist. When I applied to colleges, I decided to be truly original, or what I thought was original. Instead of being an Egyptologist, I was going to do archaeology in India, all based on the 10 page story in my book. So I looked for universities that offered archaeology, still not realizing it was a field of anthropology, South Asian studies, and Hindi. My European educated parents never once asked me, What are you doing? Have you lost your mind? <laughs> So off I went to Cornell University in Ithaca, New York to find my destiny. I learned that to be an archaeologist, I had to first be an anthropologist. I took intensive Hindi for two years, lots of Asian and South Asian classes, and a bit of archaeology. I graduated in December 1971, and oldest son Joshua was born in the spring of 1972. Field work in Peru that winter was out. I spent several good years in Ithaca working part-time as a librarian at Cornell. Pondering my future as an archaeologist, which I did not want to give up, and brainstorming possible schools with my advisor, he again suggested Idaho State University for my master's degree. It was 1974, and a few Western universities, including ISU, had created terminal master's programs in cultural resource management, CRM. Off I went for two years with a two-year-old, a full fellowship, and my own <coughs> field project once I got to Idaho. <coughs> Those were exciting times for us, the first generation of CRM archaeologists and for American archaeology in general, as cultural resource management exploded. Graduate school was exciting, interesting, and fun. <laughs> it was the 70s, right? <laughs> <laughs> Responding to an ad my mother saw in her local newspaper, I flew home to Vermont a few weeks before I finished up school in May 1976 to interview for the job of Vermont's first state archaeologist, a position established by state law in 1975. At 35,000 feet on the flight to Burlington, my life forever changed as I read Bob McGimsey's Public Archaeology in preparation for my interview with the Director, State Historic Preservation Officer of the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation and other folks. Bob reminded us that archaeology was for everyone and not just for archaeologists. His book emphasized the necessity of engaging people in our work, community leaders, landowners, avocational archaeologists, politicians, and the public. I got the job, that's my favorite part. I got the job by pretending to know a whole lot more than I knew. <laughs> I definitely knew more about archaeology than my bosses to be, and I was passionate about where I wanted to take Vermont, right out of Bob's book. My life's work became to spread the gospel of archaeology, the amazing histories we've learned, rediscovered, the cultures of our native people, and why the past matters into all corners of Vermont. And Giovanna, you can take over from there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me tonight. It is just a privilege to be in, in Tumbridge. Yeah. Look how many of you come. It's really cold, you know. Why aren't you in front of your stove? I am going to ask, there is a head. So I'm wondering if you could just scooch in this way. And we're going to get your head right out of there. Like it. yes. Oh, it is. <laughs> it is your head. <laughs> so I had a very interesting time. I'm going to put this on here. <coughs> hmm? 
think you can do this? If you hold this. Thank you. I had a very interesting time putting together tonight's presentation because this is the first presentation since I retired. So it is a retrospective, it's a looking back. And earlier in the week, I spent half a day going through dozens and dozens of slideshows, PowerPoints I've done the last, I don't know, 10 years. I've done hundreds. And I said, oh, I love this story, and I love this story, and I love this story, and I just put all these stories, and they're like 500 slides. And I went, oh, that's not going to work. So I've called it down to some of the early stories, because the later stories, a lot of them are online. A lot of more recent archaeology is on the internet, and the early stories are not. So I think we can turn off these front lights, maybe? Is that too dark? No. no. And again, thank you. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And Chuck, thank you for driving up to Montpelier to get me. I felt like an old person for the first time in my life. I had a private chauffeur. <laughs> it was wonderful. So Chuck read from this autobiographical article that I had done for the Society for American Archaeology. But one of the questions that people ask me often is, how did you become an archaeologist? Why did you decide to become an archaeologist? <laughs> and I mentor, I've mentored lots and lots of students through the decades, uh, high school kids as well as, as undergrads. And, and I definitely tell them, whatever you do, love it. If you don't love what you do, it's really hard to get up in the morning. And if you want to be an archaeologist, be an archaeologist. Don't believe your counselor. Don't believe your mom who says you're, you're not going to get a job. Because if you love it enough, you will get a job. But these are the influences in my life, as uh, Chuck read to you already. I was born in Italy, in Milano, of Italian parents. Uh, my kids are first generation American. And I came on the Andrea Doria in 1956, two months before she sank. And one of the really fun things is I had the pleasure of meeting Marty Klein, who together with uh, Dr. Ed, uh, Edgerton, Dr. Edgerton at MIT invented the side scan sonar, and he once gave me a side scan sonar image of the Andrea Doria, which I could not find this morning in my library when I want to take a picture of it for you. My mom was possibly one of my, well, the book, the famous book right there, the archaeology book that, that mom gave me in uh, 1963, apparently in New York where we were living at the time. She'd gone to a cocktail party, and this guy, Jeff, you might not be familiar with this technique, but he must have brought a case of books to the cocktail party, and he was handing them out to everybody in sight. Mom brought it home to me. I fell in love with what I thought was archaeology, which had really nothing to do with how things really went. But um, My mom was this uh, legendary maple researcher named Maria Franco Morselli, and from her, uh, I got my energy and I got my ridiculous optimism. And uh, it translated through the years that I never would take no for an answer because I just assumed somebody was having a bad hair day if they said no to me. It wasn't real that they didn't really want to say no to me. That was not their intent. So my amazing optimism has uh, really took me through a, a lot of, got me through a lot of great things. And I can thank my mom for that. So mom came up to UVM to work at the Maple Research Farm and at the Proctor Lab. And I ended up going to South Burlington High School. And it's amazing on hindsight, when you look back, that there were so many people that I intersected with in my life as state archaeologists that had gone to South Burlington High School. So those of you who've come back home to your original home, you know, who knew that the chief, chief medical examiner had been my mate in high school, and who knew that John Moody, who was the uh, very important advocate for the Abnakis, who'd gone to Dartmouth, was with me in high school and lived in our apartment complex. And who knew that one person after another that was important in my network as a grown-up had gone to South Burlington High School. Um, from South Burlington, you got a little bit of the story how I ended up going to Cornell. And uh, I think 
Cornell was disappointing. We were, I was in the anthropology program. I never took a field archaeology in New England. I ended up going to Idaho summer of junior year. But I never once met a real Indian all those years in college. Here I was surrounded by Iroquois people, and they were not invited into the department to give talks. So I'm talking 1968 to 1971, I was in the middle of Iroquois country, and there was this total disconnect between the academy and the people. And it, it, only in retrospect can I say that, because at the time I didn't know what I was missing, obviously. Off I went to Idaho State University, and that's where I understood uh, geography. I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours walking the sagebrush, discovering native sites just by finding chips and pieces of ceramic on the surface. I went to Indian powwows. I appreciated the fact that there were Native Americans, certainly out west. And um, the Fairbanks Museum, those years that I was at um, uh, Cornell, actually, I worked in the summer for the famous uh, Fred Mould at the Fairbanks <laughs> Museum. And there I learned that I love to teach and I love to work with kids and that I love museums. And that didn't come around for, that took a while to come around. <coughs> so Chuck's already told, you know, he took the thunder out of my talk here. So <laughs> this is the plane I read, this is the book I read on the airplane, Bob McGimsey's Public Archaeology, and he gave descriptions of all these programs around the country, but as uh, Chuck said, I took to heart that if I wasn't doing archaeology for Vermonters and bringing it back to them, telling stories, writing the books, getting, make, making sure everybody got the story, uh, I wasn't doing my job. And I have insisted on that with every archaeologist working in Vermont. You have got to tell the stories of what you're learning or else you do not deserve to have the job. Uh, that's a guy named Arthur Parker who's hired <coughs> as the first state archaeologist of, of New York in 1906. I was the first state archaeologist of Vermont in 1976. So you can see how far behind we were in learning about native peoples and learning about archaeology. And uh, when I walked into the division office there in Montpelier July 4th, 1976, there was a picture of a stone chamber on my desk. And Bill Pinney, my boss at the time, said, I have no idea what these are. But there's an organization called NERA, New England Antiquities Research Association. And NERA thinks they're really important. They've uh, actually developed an inventory of over 40 of these chambers. And your job is to find out what they are. And are they, are they what are they, and how important are they to, to Vermont history? So that summer, uh, the summer of 1977, I started the Stone Chamber Survey. I hired two people, and they were not archaeologists. They were just very good researchers. And we took the inventory of 40 chambers. I wrote to every town clerk in Vermont to see if we could find more chambers. We documented every single one we could find, and we ended up documenting 52 of them. Uh, there were several in Tunbridge. The majority are in Windsor County, some in Orange County. The one on the upper left is the only stone chamber I know of in Addison County, and that's actually a munitions chamber. But the type is uh, pretty true to form. You have a lintel and a post type of construction, like the Greeks did. And the inside, the, you have these high, large stone slabs. Now, how many people were in Vermont in the 70s, late 70s? And Hi, Peg. Oh, my goodness. Hello. So happy to see you. So how many people were in Vermont from like 1977 through 1981? Remember all the Stone Chamber, the controversy? Kendall Wilde was the editor of the Rutland Herald. He would have an editorial probably once a month. It was a remarkable period of time. And the NERA folks, we had this terrific collaboration. I did not necessarily agree with their uh, points of view. I didn't find that it was very well researched. But we had such a great time together. Betty Sincerbo was one of the ringleaders of uh, NERA, lived in Woodstock. So we documented all these stone chambers. And there, um, well, there are many different features. There were uh, 
these <coughs> ventilation uh, holes in most of them. We measured them. And another important aspect of the study was we documented the context of all the chambers. By context, we mean where they located, what elevation, uh, what exposure, you know, facing north, south, east, west. Um, are there cellar holes, stone walls around it? So we documented the context of all the chambers. And of course, if you think about 19th century Vermont, it was a very open environment, right? About 90% open as opposed to now. We have 10% open. But other than parts of the Northeast, Northeast Kingdom, Vermont was uh, pretty much a big open pasture. Part of the study was to look at all the stone, other stone structures, because of course Vermont, especially in a time when there were no trees around, trees had been cut, uh, stone was like an incredibly important construction element. So the uh, flu at Ely Mine that was built in 1877, um, I got to know Ely Mine very early on, and you can see again your typical lintel and post construction. Uh, this type of uh, architecture where structures are built into hillsides was actually very common for root cellars throughout the Northeast, for burial vaults such as this. Um, and then of course we looked at all <coughs> kinds of uh, stone structures and you know, from hundreds and hundreds of stone culverts, there were stone bridges, Chuck, that you had surveyed throughout Windsor County. You probably don't remember these wonderful masonry bridges also made of lintel and uh, post-construction like that. And then we had amazing, some of you may know that Vermont had the most extraordinary industrial history and in that we had these amazing glass furnaces, quite extraordinary, uh, most of them built before the Civil War. Um, in this period of time, a remarkable volunteer named Vic Rolando, who wrote a book, uh, was studying the history of all the iron, charcoal, and lime industries, and so we were <coughs> documenting one after another all kinds of lime kilns uh, all over the state, but specifically in the Green Mountains and on the east side of Vermont. And here's another amazing lime kiln that the Nature Conservancy has conserved down in um, Wyndham County. So there was this history of uh, masonry construction and masons, we talked to so many people in, as part of our research. We talked to masons, we talked to builders, we talked to farmers, historians. We talked to just hundreds of people who might be knowledgeable about the construction of these root cellars. And um, here is a pretty typical 19th century uh, well. And these are very sophisticated types of stone construction to build a well that's 15 feet deep. And we would regularly see these kinds of things in, um, across Vermont. Um, I personally undertook <coughs> the research into Vermont agriculture. And what I learned is that memory is so short, people had no idea what they had forgotten. <coughs> and talking to the Extension Service people at UVM, they said, oh no, uh, Vermont farmers never grew root crops. Well, once I got into all the agricultural journals and I read all the original um, publications from the Vermont Department of Agriculture from like 1820s and 1830s and um, they grew so many roots and we had so many sheep all over Vermont and um, I have not reread the Stone Chamber book uh, recently but I concluded that the majority of the Stone Chambers were root cellars and that this was a little remembered part of our Vermont agricultural history. One of the chambers faces north. I thought that maybe that could, it's the only one that faces north. I thought it could be an ice cellar. But that particular type of construction was absolutely common all over the northeastern United States. When I was in Iceland, I made the bus from the airport into the city stop so I could rush out and take pictures of their root cellars that looked just like our root cellars. Um, this book is now online, and at the time I was Giovanna Neudorfer, and on the right side, that's how you spelled my, my first husband's name, Neudorfer, but if you Google Vermont Stone Chambers or Giovanna Neudorfer, this book will, my book will pop right up, because we now have it 
Uh, it's been out of print for a long time. The funnest part of the book was the footnotes. I have all these awesome things in the footnotes that I was not able to put into the bulk of the book. So if you're interested in Vermont agricultural history or the famous uh, stone chamber controversy, read the book and you know, read it online or on your Kindle or whatever. It was an uh, extraordinary time where there was just so much discussion, so much controversy, so much, um, so many conferences, so, so much was written about this. And I was able to bring three entire banker boxes of all our notes and all the uh, news clippings to the Vermont Historical Society where people can research them. So if somebody, somebody's interested in getting a senior honors paper or a master's thesis on what happened then, it's all available at the Vermont Historical Society in Barrie. So staying in the early days, 1977 was a really busy time. So I come from Idaho, where I had discovered just dozens and dozens of native sites. And I was handed the archaeological inventory, which at the time had 600 archaeological sites for the entire state of Vermont. And one of the things that was apparent is that every single one of those sites had been discovered by avocational archaeologists, arrowhead collectors, people who would spend time walking farm fields and discovering sites, that not a single one of those sites had been discovered by an archaeologist or in a systematic fashion. And so in 1977, I looked and talked with the state planning office and determined that the Chittenden County was going to explode in terms of the development. And so I mapped out Chittenden County into all these grids. I hired nine kids from UVM, because I was a kid since I was 25, and they were arguably just a few years younger than me. And we spent three months uh, putting test pits across Chittenden County. And it was completely uh, randomized test pitting. And I was trying to do what we had done in Idaho with one difference in Idaho. I was the only person that had ever dug a subsurface test unit where I proceeded to find in the Great Basin this amazing earth oven, a canvas earth oven. And, and archaeologists out west were amazed, saying, you actually dug a test pit? I said, yeah. <laughs> the water was, you know, flows in this direction. There was all this silt, so I dug a test pit. When I got to Vermont, no one had ever dug a single test pit to look for a site. They were always looking on the surface. I said, what do you do? We need to dig test pits because we know that soil forms and leaves come, you know, what's the word? Worm action, the leaves rot, and we have soil, and the archaeological sites are under the ground. So we dug hundreds of test pits all over Chittenden County. And we dug in um, on the edge up there behind the synagogue in Burlington. We dug in people's backyards, and we talked to everybody. And it was amazing that we found so many sites simply talking to people. Because if you talk to any farmer in Chittenden County, they will tell you that they, they, they or their dads or their grandparents found artifacts on that particular farm. Um, here in South Burlington on Hinesburg Road, we found archaeological sites in these different backyards. And it became obvious that the interstate had altered a lot of the water courses so that there were springs that would have been used by native peoples, but that the interstate altered a lot of these drainages. So at the end of the day, we ended up discovering over 100 sites, most of them by talking to people. But part of the project was just meeting town people in the town, meeting the select board, meeting town planners, and kind of getting the word out that we're interested in archaeology. And tell us what you know. These, this is just typical of uh, arrowhead collectors that might have five, ten thousand <laughs> spear points from farm fields in Addison County, Chittenden County. Um, the early history of Burlington, written in 1812, talks about there isn't a field in Burlington that isn't covered in Native American artifacts. So these are the kinds of things that I was doing in 1977, reading all the town histories, saying who's saying what, who's writing what about. But there was no accounts of contemporary Indians. There isn't a single town history. Actually, there's, there's a couple. But I, I read hundreds of town histories. And the town histories all started out. We came and built a log cabin. 
And then this is what we did, and this is what we did. So it was the history of the Europeans, because the, Euro the Europeans were writing their own history. So slowly but surely, we started assembling history of the native peoples. Um, one of the things that happened that uh, in the late 70s, that summer of, actually it was the fall of 77, we found our first dugout canoe at Shelburne Pond. <coughs> and again, because we'd gotten the word out, we were out there looking for archaeological sites or anything that might be historically interesting. Uh, one, somebody who'd been canoeing on Shelburne Pond contacted us about this log that he turned over and turned out to be a dugout canoe. And since then, we have found three dugout canoes in Children Pond, and I've inventoried about 15 from across the state. And that's an article I'm going to do in my retirement. I'm going to write about the dugout canoes of Vermont. So dugout canoes are typically made of white pine, and these are the most ancient form of um, navigation. These are, this is Vermont's oldest uh, watercraft, are the dugout canoes. So when the native peoples first came into Vermont almost 13,000 years ago, there were no trees for a couple thousand years. <coughs> we lived in a, um, almost a tundra, open boreal forest. We did not have those huge white pines that you would need. Um, you, we, we did not have um, birch trees to make the, uh, birch bark canoes, for example. But we think that by about 9,000 years ago, uh, Vermont's native peoples were starting to make dugout canoes. And we have one that's been radiocarbon dated to the 15th century. So that's the earliest radiocarbon date we have. Um, and these are the kind of tools they would use, groundstone tools like this. So another poorly known chapter of Vermont uh, history is a very interesting thing that's going on in Orwell. So who's been in Orwell? Who knows Orwell? Very good. And in Orwell, we have a very special place called East Creek. Now, Orwell is famous for uh, one thing in particular, is that Mount Independence, where we had 10,000 American soldiers between 17, uh, what, 75 and 76, or 76 and 77? Go on. All right, well, none of us know. Um, I'm terrible with dates. So we had this incredible archaeological site on Mount Independence, and it is a state historic site. And arguably one of the most pristine, if not the most pristine, Revolutionary War sites in the entire United States. The other thing that Mount Independence has is there are these prehistoric quarries of this black chert that were used for thousands of years all over New England. There are 10,000-year-old archaeological sites in Maine that used chert from Mount Independence. The trade network. 9, 10, 11,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago in northern New England was so extraordinary that they were using church for Mount Independence. So just a quick couple of shots of this amazing East Creek Valley. And if you've never canoed there, make it a point, bring your canoe in the summer of 2015. It's this very slow-moving stream, a lot like uh, the Otter Creek, except very few people have ever been there because you have to make it a destination point. Bring a picnic. There's these amazing uh, pin oaks and this gorgeous waterfall. And one of the more harebrained schemes that have come up in the last century was Central Vermont Public Service decided to build a nuclear power plant at East Creek. And this is, this is true. It's not fiction. And... Um, this is a part, this is their, a draft of their proposal overlaying on the topo map. And I'm just going to show you this for a second. So we had this big main dam across East Creek on the left, and then we had a saddle dam, and we had all the streams dammed up. And you can see here, this is the main dam that they were proposing, and there's Mount Independence. And my boss said to me, this is still happening in 1977. This is a really busy year in 1977. My boss said, you've got to go to East Creek, and you have got to find a lot of archaeological sites. <laughs> because this is the first time that I appreciated the fact that people would use or misuse archaeology to their own ends. He said, we have to figure out how to slow down or absolutely squash this crazy idea 
of a nuclear power plant at Mount Independence flooding all of East Creek and destroying this incredible historic area. So with the same nine kids that I had, uh, and you, the same nine UVM students I had hired for the Chittenden County survey, we diverted for three weeks and off went to East Creek where we dug test pits down on the bottomlands at the top of the hills and ended up discovering over 50 sites on all these little fingers, all Native American sites, tons of black churn in these sites, meaning that this particular, uh, the use of the quarries um, had also influenced the native use of the entire drainage. And again, talking to every farmer, talking to every single person uh, owned, who owned all those lands along East Creek. And that became a really important object lesson for me. You learn more by talking to people than digging test pits. It's a cheaper way of, of doing archaeology. Talk to people. By the time I got here in 76, uh, the interstate had already been built. Uh, this is Interstate 89. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, remarkable postcard and collection of historic photos at UVM called the Landscape Change Project. And they have like tens, thousands and thousands of historic photographs online. And it's called the Landscape Change Project at UVM. And these pictures are from there, and they have scanned just amazing historic pictures from the 19th century on. And one of the points of this picture is can you only imagine the level of uh, site loss? How many archaeological sites were lost by the construction of the interstates? So this is all pre-archaeology, uh, pre-assessments as we call them. In addition to the stone chamber photograph on my desk the day I walked into my office, there was a copy of the National Historic Preservation Act. So the Preservation Act, the federal law, was passed in 1966. And Congress finds and declares that the spirit and direction of the nation are founded upon and reflected in its historic heritage, that the historical and cultural foundations of the nation should be preserved, and so forth and so on. Most importantly was the Section 106 of the Historic <coughs> Preservation Act. And Section 106 said, if there's going to be any use of federal money, federal loans, federal technical assistance, federal permits or licenses, the agency must consider the effect of that project on archaeological and historic resources. And historic downtowns, historic villages like Tunbridge, historic landscapes, and archaeological sites. Those were all under the purview of Section 106. So I studied these laws. I studied the federal laws, the federal regulation, the state laws, and I knew those really, really well. And big year, 1977, because obviously we went from zero to 10 in a very short period of time. I get wind that this group of developers is going to build a carpet factory in Winooski. And Remember that Chittenden County was still very rural in that day. I mean, now we go to Chittenden County, we don't even think it's Vermont. But in the 70s, it was just lots of farms, lots of hay fields. You know, as kids, we used to ride bikes to Shelburne. I can never imagine letting my kid ride a bike to Shelburne from South Burlington. But this was in the back side of the city of Winooski. There was this 25 acres of beautiful open land. And right on the Winooski River, and there was all this erosion. Now, our erosion is an interesting uh, phenomenon. It is bad for water quality. It is bad for archaeological sites because you lose sites through erosion, but you can discover sites. We have discovered so many sites through erosion along the Connecticut River, the Winooski River. Um, and this particular stretch of the Winooski River, right there in the city of Winooski, a group of avocational archaeologists have found what they consider to be a pretty important site. So I was able to work with the federal agency, and this was our very first time we took the federal law into and implemented it and said, hey, there's this federal law. You guys are going to build a carpet factory, and you're borrowing all this federal money. So you're going to have to deal with archaeology. So we this went through the University of Vermont, the anthropology department. They dug all these large excavation blocks. 
And this was the first scientific excavation in the state of Vermont, 1978. And it was the first time we really had the opportunity not just to look at little test units like that, but it was the first time in these large block excavations we were able to excavate things called features. So an artifact is something you can put in your pocket, like you have a piece of pottery or a spear point put in your pocket. A feature is a, is a cultural deposit that you have to excavate in the field. Features are things like fire hearths and storage pits, and they're full of just all kinds of amazing information, all, all the food remains of people's lives. And we can get charcoal for radiocarbon dating. So, for the, so right here is a picture of a, a post hole where you can actually see the um, archaeological, this is what it looks like where you once had a wigwam with like this piece of uh, this, what do you call it, a post in the ground that would have been used for a shelter, and you can actually see it archaeologically. So it's the very first time that we had a glimpse of what we can find in Vermont sites. Remember, Arthur Parker's 1906 in New York State, and here we were almost at the end of the 20th, you know, three quarters of the way through the 20th century. We're just learning this stuff. We found hundreds of pottery shirts and were able finally to understand the entire ceramic history of the ancient Vermonters. And um, Jim Peterson, who was our beloved colleague who was murdered in Brazil in 2005, he was a senior at UVM. He was my field crew chief in the 77th survey. He was a superstar right from the get-go, and he was writing this monograph on pots as a senior at UVM. It was the first time that we actually found all these pieces of ceramic and were able to assemble them together to really tell the story of this material culture. And this particular pot shirt, we've never forgotten, any of us, because there's a thumbprint. So many times our artifacts, you think, oh, is this really, somebody built this, somebody made this stone tool, somebody made this pot. But in this particular case, there's a thumbprint of the original pot on that pot. Um, we got a lot of press. It was wonderful um, to start getting press about archaeology, and it was positive. Basically, if you work closely with developers and agencies and just work in collaboration, things are not controversial. You just end up working together. And good press is great, where people can learn about things, and as I had always promised, the budget for the project included uh, publication, and I realized today that I thought I'd put it online, but it's not online. I'm going to have to rectify that with the new state archaeologist. So we had this wonderful little uh, publication, non-technical publication, 4,000 years at the Winooski site, and there's the carpet factory. So that's right on the west side of Winooski, north of the railroad, and um, we learned many lessons throughout this project, besides learning about a 4,000-year segment of Vermont history. Uh, at this one particular site, we learned that you have to pay attention to the fine print in contracts, because this one contractor decided he had a drainage problem and dug this huge uh, drainage ditch right through the archaeological site 10 years after we excavated it. And so we posted this sign and put rocks all around and worked with the community. So in the meanwhile, I was having kids. Josh was my firstborn, and it was good that he spent 10 years as an only child, because I was able to get him in the field with me as often as we could. And then the other three kids came around, and it was harder to drag everybody in the field. So I would say that my youngest son, Cameron, the 27th, uh, one next to the left of my redhead, um, I don't, he's never been in the field with me my entire life. So as the kids got older and as they progressed, they spent less and less time thinking about archaeology and doing archaeology with me. Josh was the lucky one. But um, I could only live my life because I had this amazing husband that I still have, who just sent me a good luck message before I started earlier. And um, I'm just really blessed to have somebody who was so supportive that just sort of rolls eyeballs at my intensity and passion of my, of my work. Now, I understand that Art Cohen was here speaking with you a couple years ago. So art is very much a part of my life and my story. In 1979, I'm reading the Burlington Free Press, and Art was a super publicity hound because he had a dive shop in Burlington. The more publicity, the more people would come to the dive shop. 
And in the story, it said that he would found a cannonball from the War of 1812 and that he had it over in the dive shop. But I knew my laws really well by then, and any artifact older than 10 years in the waters of Vermont belonged to the state of Vermont. So I called up Art. I said, oh, Mr. Cohen, hello. This is who I am. And I think you're in a, inadvertently violated the state law. And I said, well, why don't you come to Montpelier and we can fig figure this out. So I invited him to lunch, and he brings a lawyer. I go, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I didn't know at the time that he's also trained as a lawyer. So he was the original legal aid lawyer in St. Albans before he became a professional diver, before he became a professional historian, actually. So not only did we work out that particular issue, but we became great friends and great colleagues. And between 1980 and 1986, my office gave $107,000 in grants to something called the Champlain Maritime Society. It became obvious that we needed to look at the lake. I've been looking at all these Indian sites and on land, on private lands, and then all of a sudden, Art with his cannonball just threw the lake right to my face. And it was amazing working with all volunteers and a um, little bit of actual, well, real costs for Art and a couple of the senior divers. We spent the first six years of the 80s discovering one amazing site after another. So this predates the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, which Art and Bobby Beach created in 1989, 1990. In 1979, two divers discovered, the, uh, right off the Burlington Breakwater, the O.J. Walker. Now, people have been living in, Art had been in Vermont for 10 years, and he'd been a professional scuba diver for at least five. And, and I've been here since 76 as state archaeologist, and we hadn't found any shipwrecks. All of a sudden, under our noses, these two divers, right off the Burlington Breakwater, discover the General Butler. And it was just a complete kick in the head to us, saying, oh my gosh, if there's one, there's got to be hundreds. So this is what precipitated all those grants that we, uh, and, and the creation of the Champlain Maritime Society to say, my goodness, let's get looking at the bottom of the lake. So the General Butler uh, crashed against the Burlington Breakwater in one of those 500-year storms. It was 20-foot waves, and it's this great story. And uh, this is what it would have looked like under sail. It was one of the great sailing canal boats uniquely invented on Lake Champlain. And we did four publications with this pre press uh, preceder, or this antecedent of the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, the Champlain Maritime Society. We did four publications, and uh, it was just like this amazing, amazing time. In 1985, Art and I are worrying that we're finding these wrecks. Divers want to dive on them. He said, you have one choice, lady. He said, you control the situation or it will control you. I've never forgotten that. And we sat down together and on a napkin, a paper napkin, at this cafe in the north side of Burlington, we designed the Underwater Historic Preserves program together. And the Underwater Historic Preserves was the very first time in the United States where we invited divers to dive on our shipwrecks. But we controlled the situation by having mooring buoys on the top, we had signs down below, and we had literature. And so by inviting recreational divers to dive on the shipwrecks, we were saying, we know they're there. We have signage. We want you to moor on the buoy. Don't drop an anchor on the wreck, please. And here's literature so you can know what you're diving on, and here's the safety issues involved. So that was a very exciting time for us uh, at the very beginning of our maritime history of the lake, or our involvement with the maritime history. And since then, we've opened nine underwater preserves, eight are in Vermont, and one in New York. The thing about Vermont is you can get things done. In 1985, I went to the Attorney General of Vermont, and ever optimistic, you know, with art, on, uh, art spirit on my shoulders, I said, we have to, I need your permission, your legal permission, to open these underwater wrecks as recreational parks. And he was persuaded that well, you know, it's probably less risky to have good signage, good liter you know, good 
good literature and control the situation and let people go willy-nilly. He said, yep, yeah, let's do it. And in New York State, though, you need five different agencies to make one decision. Whereas here, it's kind of one-stop shopping with us. And that has made all the difference in Vermont. So <coughs> since then, um, Lake Champlain Maritime Museum has been our remarkable partner in the underwater preserves. And we give them uh, money every year. The General Assembly gives the, us money to give to the Maritime Museum to maintain the underwater parks, these underwater preserves, and to continue the surveys. Because one of the things about these sites is that they're all state-owned. If you have a site, Jeff, in the back of your house, it is your site. You own it. It's private land. You can destroy it if you want. But sites that are under the water are owned by the state. Sites that are on state land are owned by the state. But otherwise, Vermont is 94% privately owned. If you have an Indian site in your backyard, as long as it's not a burial, you can dig it up, destroy it, you can do anything you want. But the difference with the shipwrecks is that we already, they were already a public asset. So we had to have a special regard for them. And that kid that was uh, one of the people in the early dugout canoe slide, a few slides back, Kevin Chrisman, um, I hired him as a senior at Montpelier High School that summer of 77. Well, Kevin is now a full professor of underwater archaeology at Texas A&M. He is as much of a prince now as he was as a kid. And he's done all these amazing publications. And he cut his teeth on our land sites in Vermont and on our underwater sites on Lake Champlain. He still does work in Lake Champlain. He was there in the summer with a group. So archaeologists completely exploded with the federally required Section 106. And just one quick little example here, the infamous Chittenden County Circumferential Highway, 27 miles of proposed brand new interstate to cut across this huge swath of Chittenden County. Now, the irony is that we have identified more sites because of development than anything else. If it wasn't for all that subdivision, for all those bridges, for sewer lines, we would just not have learned a fraction of what we do know. And in this particular case, the Circumferential Highway, because of the federal law, and because of this was huge amounts of federal money, um, University of Vermont started digging uh, test units across that entire swath. Now the problem is they had to stay right in with the alignment. But they found dozens and dozens of Native American sites and historic period sites um, all kinds of important archaeology that um, they're still writing some of it up. We found the earliest, we found the largest Paleo-Indian site in the Northeast right here in Williston. This little slide down below here. Um, it was just, it's completely exploded our knowledge of what we thought we knew. In every new site, we just learned more. And more and more of these little details. Um, here again is Chittenden County, very open, very rural, and that's all the archaeological sites that were discovered as part of the Cirque Highway. It was a, a huge boon for archaeology, uh, archaeology employment, and of course I was just on the regulatory side, but uh, Bill Haviland wrote a book with Marjorie Power in 1981. I reviewed it on my honeymoon, actually, to David Peebles, and I got a free copy in exchange for a book review. You know about this stuff. And in 1994, just 13 years later, he wrote an updated edition. And the difference between what we knew in 81, just shortly after uh, I'd gotten here, and what we learned because of all this federal archaeology and state-sponsored archaeology was just unbelievable. And I just gave the library a gift of the original Vermonters. So there's a copy here now at the library. Again, it just dates to 1994, but um, I think you'll, if you're interested in archaeology, there's some really neat things in there. So here's the Native American timeline. 13, uh, we've moved it back to 12,900 years, and we've learned these stories in this period of time. So we've got, you know, gazillion artifacts and these features I was telling you about have information about housing. We've excavated 
hundreds of um, fire cars full of radiocarbon dates. We've discovered earth ovens um, where they were, this one is from Cornwall, where we think that the native peoples were roasting uh, nuts. We found five or six different kinds of nuts in these roasting ovens, these huge, huge roasting oven, like maybe 25 feet in diameter. And there it is in cross-section, deep deposits. We have found deeply, deeply buried sites that have never been impacted by plowing or by roads. And a little cross-section here, you can see, here you have um, 3,000 years worth of sites and all these different little cross-sections. This is from Swatton. And we found all kinds of um, animal material and plant material. And the most important thing is when, when we were kids in Vermont, they told us the Indians were just passing through. They never lived here. And we were able to conclusively demonstrate that the Indians have been here from the beginning of time. For almost 13,000 years, the native peoples, from the tops of the Green Mountains to every part of Vermont, we found sites in Canaan, where for the Northeast Kingdom, everywhere, everywhere. And this information was critical for the Vermont native communities to get recognition. So they, the native peoples of Vermont, there's four recognized tribes right now. They were amazingly active. They worked so hard to get recognition. But it was the archaeology that helped them um, build the case for the fact that they've always been here from time immemorial. And the preamble to the legislation in 2010 says that. So all that work um, led to that. So I'm just going to quickly uh, wrap up here. And one of the great projects was Lake Champlain's Voyages of Discoveries, where we uh, studied the French sites in Addison County. And this book is online, and I brought a copy to the library called um, Lake Champlain Voyages of Discovery, Bringing History Home. So you can get that online. Everybody's familiar with the Elizabeth Copper Mine. We all spent a lot of time. I spent dozens of meetings there in Stratford on this project. And just this last summer, right before I retired, uh, Matt Kirstead, who is the amazing industrial historian for EPA, did this book. This is also online, and I was not able to bring you a copy, but it's called From Coppers to Cleanup, <coughs> History of Vermont's Elizabeth Copper Mine. And you know what you might do if you want to print out the slideshow and leave it around? Because my slideshow is on your desktop here on this computer. So if you want to print out some of these things so that people can uh, find these online, and another huge project that we have this nice non-technical publication, I've also put that online, was this uh, Velco, is the Vermont Electric Cooperative, been working on this huge power line across over there. You can see that red line in western Vermont and found one important site after another. And they've all been uh, nicely summarized in this publication. And that, I did bring a copy for you guys. So that you have here. And in the last burst of energy in the last few years, uh, a guy named Mark Hudson, you should get him here to talk sometime. Mark is the director of the Vermont Historical Society. So he made the mistake of carpooling with me one day <laughs> in the summer of 2009 up from Grafton. And I said, you know, you've got 75,000 square feet in that building in Barrie, and half of it is empty. How would you like to put the Archaeology Heritage Center in your building? And he left, loved the idea, his trustees loved the idea, we convinced the legislature that it was a brilliant idea. And so in uh, 2010, the legislature gave us some money to retrofit 3,000 square feet here in Barrie at the Vermont History Center. And with great pride and joy, in September of 2012, we opened the Archaeology Heritage Center in Barrie as part and in partnership with the Vermont History Center. Uh, so what, what is this heritage center? What is, why, why did we need one? Well, all this digging created collections. Archaeology collections are part and parcel of what we learned because with every new generation of technology, 
we can rediscover amazing information from past collections. So that materials that we studied 30 years ago, 10 years from now, a new generation of archaeologists is going to discover whole new things <coughs> from these materials. So we have an obligation under law to maintain these forever. Now we're always culling, you know, if you have a box of bricks, we're going to keep two bricks and throw the rest out. Okay, this is expensive real estate. So we're only keeping the stuff that we feel is the most important for future research. But here's what a collection is. A collection is from native ceramics to 19th century ceramics, this amazing Oziah's Etherton house from Waterbury that dates to 1810. We have combs from uh, other historic period of house. We have all kinds of animal bones. So collections are all these things. They include the records, photographs, uh, the reports, we have 1,900 boxes of archaeology collections. So, the first exhibit I uh, created there at the Archaeology Center was, I should have named it after one of the legislators, a guy named Dick Mazza from Grand Isle in the Senate Institutions, is always asking, well, how do you know that? How do you know that? So I created an entire exhibit of, how do you know that? <laughs> how do you know it's a site? How do you know how old it is? How do you know it's a tool? How do you know what people ate? How do you know about the environment? So uh, in this long corridor, I was able to put together that particular exhibit, and that's always there. One of the Shelburne Pond dugouts, we were able to exhibit there permanently at the Archaeology Center. And we created this panel, a witness to ancient maritime traditions. And I actually created extra panels with more information that you can pick up on the side and should be online. But one of the most fun things I did before I retired that last year is I brought all these kids into the center. These are, there's so many people are non-traditional learners. Most of us in this room could be considered non-traditional learners. And the ability for kids to work with artifacts, assemble artifacts, do some internet research, read things together, ask questions, do critical thinking around these artifacts has been absolutely powerful. It has been transformative for kids who could care less about history. And we've just had such a good time working with the collections and um, just getting the kids to think about art projects and writing projects around the collections. So that's one of the, my retirement projects. I'm going to continue to work on that kind of stuff because I love that. And in my last burst of energy, in last spring, I worked with uh, Shadows and Light these exhibit designers. I had a 25-foot empty wall. Oh, 25 feet. And I said, I know exactly what I'm going to do with that 25-foot wall. I did this exhibit called 500 Generations of Continuity, Change, and Adaptation. And we created all these different panels. And so these are huge life-size panels. And I got to pick what I wanted for those panels. I was a committee of one. It was awesome. I did check in with some of my Abenaki uh, friends to make sure that they were comfortable with everything I was writing, but they were the only people who I checked in with. I did not talk to another archaeologist or historian, so this is my view of history. And this is, these are the things that we have learned that are most important about these periods of time. So 12,900 to 9,500, and then 9,500 to 6,000. Native people continued to adapt. Then 6,000 to 3,000 before present is a warming time. And then 3,000 to 2,100 years before present change in innovation. 2,100 to 1550 AD, ceramic craftsmanship and agriculture flourish. And then 1550 AD to 1780, a time of difficulty, death, and great change. This was the most horrific period for the Vermont's native peoples. And I did a lot of studying around that as part of our Lake Champlain Voyages project. And there's some amazing literature around that. And as I said, one of those booklets I brought here. And then 1780 AD to the present day, we forge a new Vermont. And I got to pick what I put on this. This is an archaeologist who looks at modern Vermont history. So you're going to have to go in person to read these panels. And. Uh, for more information, the Vermont Archaeological Society has these amazing publications, and they're pretty cheap, five for ten dollars. So you can join the Archaeological Society. We have members of the Archaeological Society here tonight, actually. 
And I have published a lot in the society journals. They're really awesome. And if you are in social media, we have a Vermont Archaeology Facebook page. And if you friend me personally, you're welcome to do that. I often post archaeology stuff. I just found a great uh, 3D of the Philadelphia on the Smithsonian website. So I posted that last night. And I already got emails from friends saying, oh my god, I'm working for the Maritime Museum. And something on the Philadelphia, I had no idea they were doing this. So I'm still sending out archaeology information through my personal Facebook page or this Vermont Archaeology Month, which I no longer administer because Jess Robinson is our new state archaeologist. And he is a remarkable young man, a great speaker, just a brilliant researcher. He's done some, his, both his master's and PhD are on Vermont topics. You should think about inviting him to talk. And I'll end by saying, keep an eye on that rear view mirror. Thank you very much. And I'm here, so Chuck wants to take me home. I'm here, I'm happy to answer all your questions. Yeah. Why, why, why the stone chambers? Why so many in Winter County? So the Stone Chamber book explains that in considerable details. Um, the underlying geology of Windsor County is the Waits River Formation. And the Waits River uh, Formation is a cheap, uh, it's a limestone, it's a cheap marble, and it is naturally occurs in uh, 4 to 12 inch uh, slabs. They very easily break apart, so it's like a nicely stratified uh, rock formation. And there's a 100% overlap with the Waits River formation in, in the stone chambers. They were very, stone masons very easily could work that stone. And we think that um, there were itinerant masons that were particularly brilliant at some of these constructions. And some masons that I worked with said, you can see their signature. They didn't sign it, but you can see the same work over and over again. And um, once you get into the history of Vermonters and New Englanders, there are communities in New Hampshire where there isn't a single public building that hasn't been moved at least twice. That people thought nothing of moving 20 ton, 30 ton, 40 ton buildings. The library, I don't like the orientation, let's move it down the road. My barn, every decade, there's a new um, innovation in agricultural thinking, and we need more solar exposure, so let's move the barn this way. People were moving enormous buildings all the time. Um, but that doesn't answer your question. That goes. Right. I'll read the book. Read the book. You have never read the book yet? What's the matter with you? It used to be on Amazon at $150, but now that it's online, the price has dropped. Chuck? You said 40 years ago there were 600 archaeological sites. What's that number? There's about 6,500 6, now. Good work. And it's a combination of native sites and historic period sites. So we have 19th century farmsteads and mills and iron foundries, blast furnaces. <clears throat> military sites, poor houses, anything that's not standing is archaeological. Now, does that mean it's important? Not necessarily. So just because it's, it, just because it's an archaeological site doesn't make it important. But it's documented. Yeah? How much work have you done with regard to the uh, roads that have been thrown up? All the stagecoach roads and so forth yeah. that we seem to have around here. I've not done very much myself. Um, I'm very interested in, in them. I have not done much. I mean, I've spent a lot of time with historic maps. So, you know, I can see where roads have changed and where there's a lot of issues around roads these days. Um, but I have not personally done any in-depth study on, on historic roads. And why were you asking? <laughs> well, we have a historic road that um, I guess uh, comes across our front lawn mm -hmm. and was thrown up about 100 years ago or so. It's only in the 30s. 
Yeah. Yes, what? <laughs> yes, what? We're getting older. Charlie's <laughs> rage. <laughs> Euclid, I don't know whether Euclid's here or not, but he has often done kind of research in terms of the various things along that road historically, in terms of, of places that you could stop and you get your kind of wheels fixed and repaired and other places that you had for uh, briefly uh, getting some kind of inebriation or in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a sort of rich area of research. And I guess these roads did change quite frequently. There's not just not one yeah. stagecoach road, but they often um, moved around a little bit, yet they were going still from A to B. I think there's many PhD dissertations worth of research to be done. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have barely tapped the surface for any kind of research. I do know that we have um, some old roads, such as the road that goes through Pownall, and the original road is on the same alignment as, as today's road. And you have, you, you put a test pit from here to where Jeff is, and you have a 4,000 year old Indian site right there. Mm -hmm. Because they either didn't maintain the road or it was flat enough, you can just put a little asphalt on it, and the drainage was well enough, you didn't have to put you know, deep drains on it. But there's just been this vast uh, change in road systems. But there are still some of the very early roads, we're still using them. You know, parts of Route 7, and uh, certainly in the back country of Vermont, mainly original roads. But your point about all these interesting archaeological sites along the old roads, that's just a huge um, opportunity for, for research that just, because so much of archaeological research is done based on the development, a lot of this research isn't getting done. We don't have a graduate school in Vermont. It's the only state in the nation without a master's or PhD program. So our anthro department, our has no master's program. So we don't have all these master's students doing research on that kind of a project. So that's been a d difficult, it's been a ch challenge for us. It's posed a challenge that we don't have enough people researching. Have you had um, Paul Gillies. Gillies talk? I was in high school with Paul, by the way. He's one of my <laughs> South Burlington high school pals. Paul would be very interesting, you know, he's done all the research on historic roads and from a legal perspective, not archaeological. But he's, I would call him a historian, honorary historian, even though he's a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> like art, honorary historian. Yeah. How far back is the archaeological period? Yeah. They say antiques are at least 50 years old or whatever, when is it archaeology and when is it just modern trash that we don't want to get up? Yeah, yeah. Well, the 50-year rule is in federal law, and it's a rule, it's, um, it's just a benchmark. It doesn't mean, just because it's older than 50 years doesn't mean it's important. So obviously common sense has to prevail here. Um, part of me thinks it's also a frequency issue. So if we have... Uh, if we have thousands of houses built in the, eight, in the 1950s and that house burns down and you have a 1950 cellar hole, um, so arguably it's over 50 years old, right? Because at this point it's 64 years old. Because there's hundreds and hundreds of those, I do not think that that 1950 cellar hole needs to be documented, okay? Um, I do think that if there was an entire neighborhood of 1950s houses and the whole neighborhood was decimated and you have this landscape of 1950s houses with 1950s features and yard elements and garbage dumps, then that might be an ex a rare example of a 1950s archaeological site. But so 50 years is, 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 the, term, is the cutoff point and I would say uh, you know, before the Second World War, but that doesn't mean people are going to document it even. 19th century is definitely in. Early 20th century could be in. 
Elizabeth Mine. Wait a second. Elizabeth Mine is an amazing example of something that continued up until the 1958, right? And that's an extraordinary historic and archaeological landscape. And, and I wish I had an extra book to give you, but I don't. They're very parsimonious. Um, they only publish you know, very few of those books. I wish I so you should buy one for the library. You. We need a volunteer. <laughs> we need a volunteer to spend $15 to buy the Elizabeth Mine book for the library. But you should have one. Uh, EPA sent a book to every single library. And do you have it? Oh, you do have it. OK, so you do have the Elizabeth Mine publication. Yes. All right, look for it. Ask the librarians. Yeah, because I had them send it to every library in the county. So that was good. Yeah, so that's an example of a 20th century important archaeological area. I was so comprehensive, there's no questions, and I've totally exhausted you. <laughs> I can't believe how many came out. This is so special. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming.